got in. Our first visit to Petticoat Lane. Looks like any old street market to me. Oh, I'm silly. Petticoat Lane's famous for its bargain. All right, don't worry, all up the pop here. Oh, the lovely old buddy, don't come on, all up the pop here. Well, they'll be daft, Aid. How can you get the Kohenor Dharma for three and six? <laughs> oh, look, look, there's a big crowd round that stall. Let's see what's going on. Now then, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm putting out this genuine Dresden tea service and I'll throw in these plastic earrings, three razor blades and a comb. I'm not asking five shillings. I'm not even asking half a crown. Ten shillings the lot. Now, who wants them? Come on, step up. Don't be shy. There's not many left. Straight out of the sea. That was an excerpt from Trader Horn. <laughs> Another of the books we recommend you to read, especially during the next half hour. <laughs> Meanwhile, for those who can't read, here's a sort of radio show which is beyond our ken. Among those taking part are the Honourable Lobelia Prescott, India Robber Woman, <laughs> Councillor Ingleby Canopus, the Mast Pipes of the Tobacco Association, <laughs> Bert Figwash, Miss Myrtle Marathon. She should go a long way. <laughs> to continue, Mervyn Le Princeton Dyke Mills, Perse Okinoko, and of course, Mr. Kenneth Horn, who prefers to remain anonymous. Ladies and gentlemen, Kenneth Horn. <laughs> Hello, good evening. Welcome to Beyond Our Ken, a show that makes you want to stand up and cheer the moment it's over. <laughs> uh, but as usual, let me tell you what I've been doing since we last met. Last week I went down to Bournemouth, and it was terribly hot. So was the weather. <laughs> Actually, it was 72 in the shade, but I was clever. I stayed in the sun. <laughs> Monday I went along to the swimming pool, and I could hardly breathe. My eyes were popping and my tongue was hanging out. I was judging a beauty contest. <laughs> Matter of fact, the contest was organized by a local greengrocer, and all the girls represented fruit and vegetables. There was Miss Tomato, Miss Celery, she was a good-hearted sort, <laughs> Miss Orange, who had tremendous appeal, <laughs> Miss Potato, well, all eyes were on her, uh, Miss Asparagus was strongly tipped, but... Uh, <laughs> Eventually, I awarded the prize to Miss Onion, and later on I had quite a lot of fun with Miss Onion. I, I got her pickled. <laughs> Actually, I was sorry when it was time to take the train home. I, I got into a non-smoker, and there was another chap in the compartment, so I asked him where he was going, and he said, Nowhere, I'm just trying to give up smoking. <laughs> Which at the time I thought was rather amusing. Gone off it since, never mind. <laughs> However, when I got back home, there was quite a bit of tidying up to do. I was potting around the bedroom, and there was a knock at the door. The wardrobe door. <laughs> Good gracious, someone's in the wardrobe. Good evening, sir. Arthur Figley is the name. I represent the foolproof burglary insurance company. Now, what about a policy or two? I can do you a very nice bit of insurance. Take this one. For a premium of only £2 a year, I can cover you against woodworm. Of course, you'll have to be medically examined. <laughs> well, what for? You might have it already. <laughs> now then, here's our gilt-edged policy. Careful, the paint's still wet. This is a special, super, incomprehensible deluxe job. Covers you completely. Well, now, let's have a look. Yes. Oh, this is interesting. It says here, if I get a bump on the head, I get a lump sum. <laughs> that is correct. Now, just have a butcher's at some of the other benefits. For a mere £500 per annum, or 12 months, whichever is the shorter, <laughs> you are fully protected in the event of your being trapped in a deck chair, manhandled by a policewoman, or savaged by a goldfish. <laughs> yes, but those things aren't likely to happen to me. Do you want them to happen to you? No. Well, belt up. <laughs> Where are we? Oh, yes, here's another astounding clause. £5,000 if you're knocked down by a herd of stampeding elephants. And I get the same if I'm knocked down by a car? Only if it's driven by an elephant. <laughs> right. 
That'd be 500 pounds, and you have to pay the first installment right away. Well, come downstairs, and I'll give you a check. Oh, oh uh, excuse me, Willow. Good heavens, it's Pat Lancaster. <laughs> Well, jolly nice, Pat. Now you're here, come on into the library. I'd like to show you my Conan Doyles. Oh, well, it's a nice change from etchings. Yes, there you are. They're in that bookcase. That's a complete set of all the Sherlock Holmes stories. Well, I don't think I've ever read any. Well, they're still very popular, you know. In fact, they've just made a film of my favourite one, The Hound of the Baskervilles. Has it ever been done on radio? Well, yes, Pat, but they've never done the other classic, Wolfhound of the Tuskervilles. That is, not until now. My name is Sherlock Holmes. I'm a criminal. I'm a criminal. A criminal. I'm a detective. <laughs> I've solved many interesting cases. For instance, the case of the swinging door. Now, that was open and shut. <laughs> the case of the gaping lift shaft. Soon got to the bottom of that. And then, of course, there was the strange business of the missing embassy official, which I laughingly referred to as the attache case. <laughs> but I mustn't bore you with these cases that happened so long ago. Let me bore you with one that happened recently. <laughs> I had just returned to my chambers in Baker Street after a quick visit to my baker in Chambers Street. <laughs> when there came a knock at the door. Come in. Good afternoon, Dr. Watson. Good afternoon, Holmes. I, uh... Just a minute, Watson. Don't say a word. <laughs> yes. At five past ten this morning, you entered Hyde Park by the Marble Arch Gate. You sat in a deck chair about fifty yards due east of the bandstand, where you remained until you saw the attendant approaching. <laughs> <laughs> on, uh, on leaving the park, you paused to have a piece of mud re removed from your left shoe, and you came home via the saloon bar of the Spotted Dog. Am I right? Well, that's uh, positively uncanny, Holmes. How do you know? <laughs> I was with you. <laughs> It's incredible. It's so simple, just a matter of education. Well, what's wrong with my education? Elementary, Watson. <laughs> now, what were you going to say? Well, I was only... Don't just... tell me, let me guess. Could it possibly be something in connection with the missing home office plans? No. The Van Dyke forgery affair? No. The Hatton Garden diamond robbery? No. Try the Maltravers blackmail case. Thank you. <laughs> then is it the Mel Travers blackmail case? No. <laughs> All right, Watson. What is it? There's someone to see you. I think it's a, a bearded lady house painter. What makes you think that? Well, she's wearing a short skirt and she's got a paintbrush tied round her waist. You fool, Watson. It'll be a Scotsman in a kilt. <laughs> Show him in. All right, but I'm not convinced. Come in, sir. Or madam. <sighs> <laughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Holmes. I've come to see you about a strange and terrible business. Uh, then I trust you won't object to my playing the violin while we talk. <laughs> it helps me concentrate. No, certainly not. Go right ahead. Nice. Well, well, what is it? Do you know the legend of the wolf hound of the Tuskervilles? Uh, no. How does it go? <laughs> it's not a tune, it's a curse! Well, those are my sentiments too. Holmes, stop playing that violin. Oh, very well. You don't mind a pipe, do you? Oh, of course not. Good. <laughs> Look here! What's... what's going on? You must forgive him showing off. It's a sort of ideal Holmes exhibition. <laughs> oh, you just listen. For generations, the Tuskerville family has been stricken by a horrible curse, which takes the form of a great ravenous wolfhound roaming the bleak, desolate moors. <laughs> I fear that the present heir to the title... Sir Philip Tuskerville is in great danger. 
Only you, Sherlock Holmes, can save Sir Philip. <laughs> well, Holmes? You know, Watson, there are certain baffling aspects of this affair which rather appeal to me. For instance, who was that? <laughs> yes, I'll take the case. You follow on with the trunks. <laughs> There's no time to lose. We must get there right away. Yes, good idea, Holmes. But where? Where are we going? <laughs> Watson, it won't take a moment. Now then, let me see. Mm, yeah. mm -hmm. Ah, I got it. We're going to Tuskerville Hall. Well, fantastic, Holmes. How did you deduce that? Simple, Watson. I took a crafty peep at the next page of the script. <laughs> I wish you'd be more careful, Holmes. You trod right on my foot. <laughs> so this is Tuskerville Hall. Good evening. Ah, it's the hound, the hound. No, it isn't. It's me with the flaps of my deer stalker pulled up. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm Sherlock Holmes. Now, uh... Why are you dressed like a housekeeper? I am the housekeeper, sir. <laughs> a likely story. <laughs> now then, madam, where were you last night between the hours of ten and midnight? I was alone in the kitchen. Oh, you should have been with us. We had a wonderful time. <laughs> just a minute, Watson. There's a gaunt figure just come through the French windows. <laughs> Who are you? I am a French window cleaner. <laughs> A French window cleaner? What else has he to do with the story? Yes, and just look at you. You look as if you've been pulled along the ground. Well, I was just dragged in for the joke. <laughs> now then, housekeeper, tell us about the wolf hound. Yes, I like a good shaggy dog story. <laughs> no good asking me. The man who knows all about it is old Soames Fitzroy, the neighbouring farmer. He's got a dozen farm hands working for him. And do any of them ever come here? Not since I told old Soames to keep his hands to himself. <laughs> there it is! There it is! The hound! Where is Sir Philip? He be out on the moors with some girl. <laughs> Now keep close to me, Watson. We're surrounded by a quagmire. I don't want you to put your foot in it. <laughs> Do you hear me, Watson? Watson! Holmes! I'm sinking! Here! Take my hand! <clears throat> oh, thank you, Holmes. I've always been a bit of a stick in the mud. Look! There in the bushes! It's ghastly! What is it, Holmes? Watson, never in the delirious dream of a disordered brain could anything more savage, more appalling, more hellish be conceived than that terrifying face which is peering at me through the fog. Hello. <laughs> yeah. A lovely night for a stroll. Sir Philip, you. What are you doing out here? You <laughs> Didn't you hear that terrible howling? Of course I did. <laughs> it was me. I've always been a bit of a wolf. Sir Philip, don't you realise you're in terrible danger? Don't move! Oh, oh, why? What is it? Nothing. I want to remember you just as you are. <laughs> ah! Ah! Oh, look behind you! It's the hound! <laughs> oh, I wonder if he's a member of the Tailwaggers Club. <laughs> All right, leave this to me. I'll deal with the wolf hound of the Tuskervilles. Well done, Holmes, another case solved. Not quite. That dog was being used to frighten Sir Philip by someone after the family fortune. Ooh, they knew, was he? Soames Fitzroy. The local police will have him in custody by now. But Holmes, how on earth did you know it was Fitzroy? Perfectly obvious, my dear Watson. He gave himself away in that speech we had to cut at rehearsal. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Holmes, thank you for saving my life. Here, I want you to have this check. Oh, come on, Philip. I'm coming. 
Oh well, back to the bird in the bush. <laughs> I say, Herman, look at this check. Oh, how very generous. Fifty thousand pounds. Now we can get back to London and forget all about the wolfhound of the Tuskerville. Yes, my dear Watson. And now I know how I'm going to use the money. What do you mean, Holmes? Elementally, I'm going to the dogs. <laughs> And so, from the world's greatest detective to four people who haven't got a clue uh, what I'm going to say next. But who is behind the curious affair of my Bonnie? Elementary, my dear ladies and gentlemen, it's the Fraser Hayes Four. Bring back my body to me. And so to the Kenneth Horn documentary feature, Horn or Armour. Yes, once again, Kenneth Horn and his team of investigators bring you a factual report on topics of immediate interest. And tonight, we present a close up on cricket. Will cricket matches go on forever? Or does it just seem like it? <laughs> well, now, for the benefit of those to whom cricket is still a mystery, like like Americans or like the English test selectors. <laughs> Let me explain. There's a cricketer here. <laughs> Cricket is a very gentlemanly game and is always played in the great heritage of true British sportsmanship. That's why two umpires are required to see that nobody cheats. <laughs> um, let's first talk to a well-known county cricketer. Now, sir, would you tell us your most memorable moment on the cricket field? Uh, yes, certainly, with pleasure. <laughs> It was in an exciting match against Middlesex. You see, I was at the crease facing their spin bowler. He sent down a fast and somewhat disguised in-swinger, and I took a sudden swipe at it. And you were out? No, but my teeth were. <laughs> ah, bad luck. Now let's meet the hero of the cricket-speaking world, Mr. L.V.W. Keeper. <laughs> That's rather a nasty gleam you have in your eye, Mr. Keeper. Ah, uh, yes. You see, I'm one of the wicked keepers. <laughs> I see. Uh, Tell me, when did your interest in cricket first develop? Well, actually, I've always wanted a cricket bat, you know. Well, I can remember when I was four years old, I first asked the old painter for a cricket bat. I said, Daddy, can I have a cricket bat? <laughs> uh, go on, Daddy. Hey, Daddy? Uh, do give me a cricket bat. Uh, go on, Daddy. Hey, Daddy? I must have a cricket bat. <laughs> now, hey, Daddy, I'm gone, Daddy. <laughs> and did he let you have it? Right in the mush. <laughs> Very painful. Now then, Mr. Keeper, what was your most memorable... What was your most memorable experience in the field? Ah, yes. That would undoubtedly be when I played with Grace. Oh, yes. Grace... Grace Tippett. Oh. <laughs> what a girl. I used to call her googly. She never knew what she was going to do next. <laughs> well, it's a traditional game, all right. I remember myself when I captained the Ponder's End Women's Eleven. I was always known for my unorthodox leg glances. However, <laughs> let us now consider the problem of the batsman who often has to face demon bowlers. What's it really like to face up to one of these speed merchants? We sent Cecil Snaith to find out. Well, listeners, I'm at the gasworks end of this famous pitch at the Oval Cricket Ground. Uh, I'm at the wicket now, and judging from the field that's been set, I think the best way to deal with Frank Tyson is a quick snip through the slips. Well, I'm taking guard now as Tyson walks back to start his run. Oh, the uh, wicketkeeper obviously wants to say something, probably a cheery word of encouragement. Here, Snape, have you got any last requests to make? <laughs> 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 These professionals love a little joke. <laughs> well, now, I, I see that Tyson has started his run. He's gathering momentum all the time. I'm squaring up, preparing to hit the ball. And... Oh! Hold on, man! And this is Cecil Smith from the top of the gasometer returning to the street. <laughs> Well, 
Well, for real cricket lovers, the BBC plays its part during the season. For whenever you switch on during the summer, you can be sure of hearing one of those colourful BBC commentaries. Well, here at Old Trafford, we greet listeners with the news that it's raining. <laughs> the captains inspected the pitch half an hour ago, and when they rode back, they decided that play was not possible. We can never understand why, when play isn't possible, they don't give us a commentary on what is going on inside the pavilion. So over now to John Arlott. Well, here in the pavilion, you've arrived at rather a tense moment. Graven is facing the dealer, and after a quick glance round at the other card players, he selects a card, and with that long gliding motion we know so well, he plays a king of diamonds. Oh, and Evans has trumped him. Well played, Evans. And Oh, here's a bit of excitement now. A dog has just chased Laker across the pavilion and he's caught him. Get away, get away, get away. Yes, I thought so. Laker's appealing to him, but it's no good. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and he's been given out at backward point. <laughs> well, it's time to return you to the studio, so with the news that cream buns have now been handed round and the English team is having rather a sticky time, it's goodbye from me from Old Trafford. Well, cricket is all very well for the men, but how do the women feel about it? Can they ever take a real interest in it? Well, as far as cricket on the village green is concerned, it's quite a common sight to see the players' wives turn out to share their husband's moment of glory. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, hello, darling. Hello, Ambrose. So you decided to come back, have you? Yes, I was clean bowled. Celia mustard me needs not bad. Uh, a hundred and eighty-five. Yes, well, you do very well for your age. Uh, you silly me off. No, I mean hundred and eighty-five runs. Indeed, Ain't you proud of me for no, no, Ambrose, you're very selfish, staying out there all day. Oh, that's the idea. I know, dear, but while you were out there for so long, all these other men wanted to play. Oh, they didn't worry me. I've always trusted you. <laughs> Now, finally, let us turn from cricketers to the other important men at any cricket match, those two familiar white-coated figures who stand out in the sun all day and unobtrusively make their contribution to the game of cricket. Hello, Rodney. Hello, Charles. <laughs> it's sweltering, isn't it? Oh, it certainly is. The pullovers will be coming off today. Well... Who do you think will win? Hard to say. You can never tell in this game. Mind you, Wessex has a crafty side. Yes. You keep an eye on their fast bearer and watch how he drags his foot over the crease. Mm. Ah, here come the teams. Come on. I say, what a crowd today. Absolute packer. Still, it's good for the game. Oh, come on, we're in a position ourselves. Will you take, will you take the nursery in? All right, Rodders. You take the pavilion in. Okay. So I'll see you later. I say, love you, I say. <laughs> This is Kenneth Horne saying goodbye for now and leaving you with this thought, which comes from a listener. If a watchmaker entered on a life of crime, would he wind up in jail? Good night. <laughs> You have either been listening to or have just missed Beyond Our Ken, a sort of recorded radio show which gave employment to Kenneth Horne and also to Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Betty Marsden, Bill Pertwee, Patricia Lancaster, the Fraser Hayes Four and the BBC Variety Orchestra conducted by Paul Fennelly. The script, believe it or not, was written and letters of complaint should be sent to Eric Merriman and Barry Took. However, the onus must inevitably fall on our producer, Jake Brown. <laughs> Yeah.
uh, Inky, I'm having a big birthday party tomorrow. Um, can I borrow that book of yours? No. Oh, go on, be a sport. You lent it to every other boy in the school. Yes, and they all paid for to look. I ain't got no money till I... I tell you what, though. I'll give you my Spaceman's badge, my champion marble, and one bit of used bubble gum. Oh, all right. Here it is, then. Cool. Smashing. Cool. Now my party will be a big success. Let's have a look. Susan Brown, Rosemary Smith, Madge Turnbull, Jay Robinson, Wendy Harvey. That was an excerpt from Every Boy's Book of Birds. <laughs> Another of the books we recommend you to read, especially during the next half hour. <laughs> Meanwhile, for those who can't read, here is a sort of radio show which is beyond our ken. Among those taking part are Cowgill Trench, film starred Sophia Crockett, the Maudlin College Shovehapney team, Mr. J. Nolan Frange and Friend, Miss Fifi Bonbon. I bet she's a cracker. <laughs> to continue, Pearly King Siegfried von Hausenblatt, Meridule Lumley, and, of course, Mr. Kenneth Horne, who prefers to remain anonymous. Ladies and gentlemen, Kenneth Horne! <laughs> Hello, good evening. Welcome to Beyond Our Ken, the show where you start laughing at the very first joke and don't stop until the second. <laughs> well, now, as usual, I've had a hectic week. On Monday, the Air Ministry told me they were having a big RAF march past and they asked me to lead the parade. Apparently, the goat was sick. <laughs> However, I couldn't go because I'd already arranged a visit to Hull. It was the BBC's idea, actually. They said to me, Horn, why don't you go to Hull? And <laughs> so I did. I, I visited one factory up there, and I had a special escort of two motorcycles all the way through the town. Created quite an impression, but, oh, you know, one feels a bit embarrassed running along between two motorcycles. <laughs> On Wednesday, I eventually decided to sack my secretary. For a, for a long time, I'd noticed that she was going home earlier and earlier, so finally, I just had to say to her, look, um, don't you know when it's time to stop? And she said, of course, when we hear someone coming. <laughs> and so, so you see, she had to go, and on... Thursday, my wife insisted on choosing my new secretary. Very nice chap, too, he was. <laughs> Nevertheless, on Friday, Friday, well, it was quite a day. Prudence had gone to the pictures, and when I went to make the tea, I discovered there was no water. So naturally, I sent for the plumber. Ah, then, you, uh, you must be the plumber. I have that honour, yes. Uh, the name's Arthur Figley, and this is my son, Edward. Oh, yes. Well, come in, won't you? Thank you. Our card. Now, what's this? Arthur Figley and son builders, mm. decorators, plumbers, electrical engineers, and flower arrangements. Mm. <laughs> flower arrangements? That is correct. Edward here, he's known as the constant spry of Ledbrook Grove. <laughs> Yes. Well, that's so, Edward. Yes, that's right, sir. I won first prize for my floral clock. Oh, I thought he looked a bit seedy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but you should see him in July. He's a proper picture. I, I believe you wanted to see us, though, a professional capacity. Yes, yes, yes. I, yes, I mean, you... Yes, call, yeah. quite. I, I'm afraid I've got no water. Oh, well, we'll have to have it neat. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> no, you look, you don't understand. I mean, there's no water coming through the taps. Oh, well, I'd better look at them. Uh, let's just turn the tap on and make sure. Well, there you are. Just a couple of drips. I'll oh, thank you not to be personal. <laughs> now then, I'll just get these floorboards up and check on the main water supply. Uh, what are you doing, Figley? The main water pipes aren't under the floorboards? Now he tells me. <laughs> Hello, what's this? Mr. Orn, would you come here a minute? Yes, what's the trouble? Just put your finger down here. You mean here? Oh! As I thought, a short circuit. <laughs> Edward, just unravel these wires while I go upstairs. OK, Dad. I'll come with you. Right. Nice place you've got here. Lovely pictures on the wall and... Oh, I must just stop and admire this. Figley, you're looking in the mirror. I know. 
Oh, handsome devil and I. <laughs> Come on, Finley, now. Here's the trap door to the loft. Right. Give us a leg up. Okay. Uh, oh. Are you all right? Uh, uh, well, it's a trifle dark. You'll find the tank up there somewhere. <laughs> Here, hello. There's someone in here with me. Fella with a bald head and a long arm. Finkley, that's the ball cop. <laughs> Highly whimsical. Oh, so it is. It appears to be jammed. Hold on. <laughs> That's fixed it. Now, Mr. Orn, turn your bath tap on. All right, here goes. <laughs> Figley, what are you doing in the bath? I didn't get out of the tank fast enough. <laughs> anyway, it's quicker by tube. <laughs> Oh, come on, get out of there. Now, here's a towel. I'm going down to see what your son's up to. Well, there you are, sir. It's all back to normal. Right, well, I'll try the cold water tap. What on earth have you done? I don't know, Mr Horn, but if I was you, I wouldn't turn the radio on or you'll flood the place. <laughs> Figley, Figley, here. Hello, hello. What's up now? Well, it's positively disgraceful. Just listen to this. I'll turn the tap on. Well, I suppose some people like it. Yes, but... Uh, but... Shh, shh, shh. So we come to the end of today's Over 60 Club. And now it's time for Songs for Swinging Plumbers, and here is your resident vocalist. Good afternoon. Good heavens, it's Pat Lancaster. <laughs> oh, well, I suppose it's quite a nice idea to have Pat Lancaster on tap. <laughs> I found that most refreshing. Well, come on, Edward, we must be off. Yes, but what am I going to do? There's only one thing you can do, sir. You better get a license for that tap. Good afternoon. <laughs> oh, dear. I suppose I'd have to get onto the waterworks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they've arrived, too. <laughs> prudence, Prudence, whatever's the matter? Oh, sir, it was the film, sir. <laughs> it was lovely. Yes, <laughs> well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. There, Prudence, come now and sit down. Um, Tell me all about it, if you think it'll help. Oh, well, sir, it was called A Woman in Curlers. <laughs> Got your anky ready? Yes. Good. Well, you see, there was this woman, and she was losing her husband's affection because she'd been letting herself go. <laughs> Every morning it was the same. He'd come down to breakfast. Where's my breakfast? Oh, where it is in the coal scuttle. <laughs> Watch this. Underdone bacon, burnt toast, broken egg and a cup of hot water. <laughs> Things are looking up. Oh, thank you, Ted. I, I made a special effort this morning. Why? Don't you remember? It's our anniversary. Oh, is it? Honestly, Frida, look at this place. Call it home. Dirty crocs on the piano, weeks washing on the picture rail. No bicycle in the armchair. <laughs> and look at that old junk heap in the corner. Ted, that's no way to speak of our lodger. Oh, sorry, Purse. Oh, what then, Ted? Oh, Mr Pilkington, you've grown a beard. No, I haven't. It's your cat. <laughs> Call him off, will you? I've stuffed him in my pipe twice. <laughs> Here's another thing. A perishing cat of yours, scruffy old thing. He's not. Besides, black cats are lucky. Yes, but he was white when we bought him. <laughs> I tell you, Freed, I, I, I can't live in this hovel much longer. Now look at you. Woman I married. 
Slopping around in that filthy old dressing gown with your hair in curlers, still wearing last week's makeup. Oh, Ted, thank you. <laughs> Who are you thanking me for? Well, Mr. Pilkington, a woman likes to be noticed. <laughs> well, I'm off. Goodbye, all. Here, yeah, Ted. What is it? Well, you know that Mr. Argleaves next door? He always kisses his wife goodbye every morning. Oh, I wish you would. Don't be daft. I hardly know the woman. <laughs> By the way, I shan't be home tonight, working late. What, again? Every night for the past six months you've been out at nights, working late, you say? But let me tell you, Ted Ogmore, a woman has an intuition about these things. It's getting more difficult to believe that you're really working late. What makes you say that? You're unemployed. <laughs> oh. Is that all? One horrible moment, I thought you'd found out about Phyllis. <laughs> or Bile. Oh, oh, that's it. My husband and another woman. What shall I do, Mr Pilkington? Well, uh, I should find out who the other woman is and go and speak to her. No, I know what I'll do. I've made up my mind. I'm going straight round to the Citizens' Vice Bureau. <laughs> And uh, so if you take my advice, you'll, you'll find a good man, marry him, and settle down. Gee, that's swell. Thanks a lot. Not at all. It's been a pleasure, Miss Gabor. <laughs> next, 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 please. Morning. My name's Mrs. Ogmore. Yes, well, you could change it by deed poll, couldn't you? <laughs> and is that what you've come to see me about? Oh, no, no. It's about my husband. Well, now, just a minute. Before we begin, tell me, do you always wear a dressing gown? Yes. Well, if it's good enough for Noel Coward, it's good enough for me. <laughs> well, now, what is your problem? You see, my husband, my husband, he doesn't find me glamorous anymore. And he's gone off with another woman. What can I do? Well, I'm simple. You must make yourself attractive again. T I tell you what, go to a beauty parlour, have a thorough beauty treatment, get your hair done in a new style, have a manicure, a new cord for your dressing gown. <laughs> yes, make yourself a wonderful, glamorous person, like a film star. And when your husband comes home tonight, think of the surprise he'll get. <laughs> Freed! Where are you? Hello, darling. <laughs> Here, who are you? It's me, Ted. Freed. Diamond, what? <laughs> what have you done to yourself? It's for you, Ted. I wanted to make myself look like a film star. Yes, but you're Brunner. <laughs> So you see, it didn't work. Well, then there's only one other thing you can do. Make him jealous. Let him see you with another man. But I don't know any other men except the milk... That's it. The milkman. Good idea. Good idea. Leave him a note. Oh, I hope it works. <laughs> Morning. Is the milkman? I got your note. Yeah, now don't muck about. What do you want to see me for? Well, milkman, I want you to make love to me. Oh. You've been having too much yogurt lately. Now listen, listen. My husband will be home at any minute. Put your arms round me. Well, I miss. <laughs> oh, sorry, I forgot to put the bottles down. There, that's better, that's better. Now, when he comes in, I want you to kiss me. But I'm halfway through my milk round. Oh. No, please, please, I want to make my husband jealous. Well, what about my horse? No, he wouldn't be jealous of him. <laughs> quick, quick, here he comes. Act passionate. Freedom out! Mm. Oh, my darling. Even though I'm only an half pint, my love... <laughs> my love for you is great, eh? Oh, let me hold you to my jersey. 
and ran my fingers through your gold top. <laughs> You're the cream in my coffee. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, hello, Milkman. You're very cooperative this morning. <laughs> Now then, put my wife down and get out. All right. I'm going. Yes, go. Never leave milk on my doorstep again. <laughs> I lose more customers this way. Ted, Ted, I do believe you're jealous. Of course I'm jealous. Oh, freed, I've been a fool. Oh. I was weak, but I realise now that a man shouldn't stop loving his wife just because she likes to live in filthy, dirty squalor. <laughs> Ted, that's the nicest thing you ever said to me. Freed, Freed, things are going to be different from now on. We're going to get away from this place. I, I've got a job. You have a job! <laughs> See, it's a, it's a job for both of us. It'll be a whole new life we're going to live in as caretakers. Oh, Ted, where? The Institute of IG. <laughs> And now it's time once again to meet our vocal and instrumental group whose latest record has just gone straight to the top of the Brixton rubbish dump. <laughs> this week they've been out hunting for songs and eventually they ran to earth one called Jaken John Peel. So, yoikes, tally ho, it's the Fraser Hayes Four. <laughs> Can John Peel with his coat so gay? Do you can John Peel at the break of day? Do you can John Peel when he's far, far away with his hands and his horn in the morning? And so to the Kenneth Horn documentary feature, Hornorama. <laughs> Yes, once again, Kenneth Horne and his team of investigators bring you a factual report on topics of immediate interest. And tonight, we present a close-up on communication. Are we getting the message? Well, first, let's have a brief look at the history of communications. The very first method of communication was, of course, the human voice. For instance, the caveman. <laughs> Eh? Oh, I wish I'd said that. However, sounds soon became speech, and men communicated like this. Hey, Charlie. Hello. Well, this was only practicable at close quarters, but for longer distances, man developed this method. Hey, Charlie! Centuries passed, and then... Hello! <laughs> the first important method of communication over long distances was the runner, who sometimes had to travel many hundreds of miles to deliver his message. My lord, I bring a message from the great Atticus. Three hundred leagues have I run over the Iconicus, down the plains of Olympus, through the snowy wastes of Sabina, and across the arid deserts of the Xerxes, and it swim the boiling waters of the Hellespont. And what message do you bring from my lord, Atticus? He wants to know if you can spare half a cup of sugar. <laughs> However, communications were improved considerably with the introduction of postal services. At first, the mail was sent by a stagecoach. And tonight, we have with us one of the original coachmen, Mr. Arthur Tantippi. Good evening. Now, would you, sir, uh, like to tell us about your life on the mail coach? Yes. It was a hard and dangerous life. Carrying all those valuables on the London to York Road. I remember the last time I done that run. We was held up by highwaymen. Oh, well, when was that? Yesterday. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Tantivy. We'll have a, a whip round later. <laughs> yes, the postal services gradually expanded, and today it's a vast and complicated organization. 
The stagecoach has, of course, been replaced by the express train. Over now to Chiddingfold Station for a report from Cecil Snaith. While I am standing now at the far end of this platform at Chiddingfold Station, the express is due at any moment, so let me tell you exactly how the mail is collected. Um, I am standing by a long steel arm on which is hung a large mail bag. <laughs> and as the train goes through the station at something like 60 miles an hour, a steel-framed net swings from the train, scoops up the mail bag, and drops it into the sorting office aboard the train. Well, I, I think I can hear the express coming now. Yes, it's a fascinating operation for those who haven't seen it, and it won't be long now before I can describe the action of the And this is Cecil Smith from a pigeonhole on the Flying Scot, returning home to the studio. Poor old Cecil, he's been posted. <laughs> well now, of all the modern methods of communication, the one most widely used is radio. What a thrilling moment, that very first discovery of the wireless. Oh, yes, Felicity. You really shouldn't work so hard, oh, dear. No, 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 you'll kill yourself at the rate you're going. Look at you, all worn and haggard. You can talk. <laughs> anyway, it's worth it. This will be the greatest invention of them all. I, I shall call it the wireless. Oh, but Andrews, dear, you've been working like this for years now. I must go on. Oh, Don't you understand? I feel I'm nearly there. If only I could just discover the secret of the thermionic valve. Andrews, darling, you uh, must relax uh, for a little while. Uh, Why don't you sit down? Down with me and watch the television. <laughs> yes, radio plays many parts in this modern age. For instance, in the fight against crime, high-powered police cars patrol our roads, controlled from headquarters by the latest electronic equipment. Calling car 32. Calling car 32. Come in, car 32. Your time is up. <laughs> Well, not only on the ground, but also in the air, radio serves mankind. Consider now the vital contact between pilots and airfield control. Hello, Arthur Rodney. Arthur Rodney, are you receiving me? Over. Hello, see for Charles. <laughs> receiving you loud and clear. Over. Hello, Rodney. Now listen carefully. My undercarriage is jammed, my petrol gauge is registering zero, and my joystick is terribly wobbly. Over. <laughs> Hello, Charles. You are in a pickle, aren't you? <laughs> Over. Yes, I am. Can you help me? Yes, of course. That's what we're here for. You'll have to give me your position. I repeat, see for Charlie, what is your position? Charles, can you hear me? Charles, where are you? I'm in the hangar. <laughs> Finally, let's turn to a more domestic form of communication, the telephone. Just recently in Great Britain, the post office has instructed its telephone operators to show politeness, courtesy, and above all, friendliness to subscribers. Hello, sir. I'm delighted to tell you your number is ringing. Oh, thank you. Perkins, United Castings. Perkins here. Perkins, this is J.G. You stupid, blundering, blithering idiot. Where are my lipped flanges? They're not ready. We didn't promise delivery until the 25th. I don't want to hear your SNI excuses, you fat fool. No, 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 gentlemen. That's no way to talk to each other. Who the devil's that? Ah, uh -huh. shouting won't help. I want my lipped flanges. <laughs> All this fuss over some silly little lipped flanges. Oh, come, come, gentlemen. I'm sure Mr. Perkins is doing his best. Of course I am. And you, J.G. I feel sure that deep down you're really a gentle soul, aren't you? Well, yeah, I suppose I am. <laughs> well, then, apologize. All right. Sorry, Perkins. Sorry, J.G. That's better. <laughs> now we're all good friends again, aren't we? Yes. Uh, Perkins, how about us getting together for a drink? Good idea. My place at six? <laughs> Well, 
there you are, there'll be another Hornorama next week when the subject will be horse riding, does it go to your head? <laughs> also, next week's programme, there'll be a talk for schools by a well-known gardening expert on weeding, whiting and arithmetic. <laughs> The Italian tenor, Senor Stromboli, will sing Lava, Come Back to Me. <laughs> and there'll be a dramatised excerpt from the Eskimo Repertory Company's production of Polar Bear on a Cold Tin Roof. <laughs> so until next week then, this is Kenneth Horne saying goodbye for now and leaving you with this thought, which again comes from a listener. Does a stocking manufacturer see the seamy side of life? Good night. <laughs> You have either been listening to or have just missed Beyond Our Ken, a sort of recorded radio show which gave employment to Kenneth Horn and also to Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Betty Marsden, Bill Patwee, Patricia Lancaster, the Fraser Hayes Four and the BBC Variety Orchestra conducted by Paul Fennelly. The script, believe it or not, was written and letters of complaint should be sent to Eric Merriman and Barry Took. However, the onus must inevitably fall on our producer, Jakes Brown. <laughs> Marjorie, what on earth are you doing with the pony and trap? I've got to get to the village. I must, I must. No, you can't. The saddler hasn't repaired the harness yet. But, Mountjoy, that doesn't matter. I've got to get there. The horse knows his way blindfold without harness. It's too dangerous, Marjorie. You'll just have to wait until... The... Oh, there's the postman. Ah, morning, sir. Parcel for you. Oh, Mountjoy, is it the harness from the saddler? Yes, Marjorie. At last they've arrived. <laughs> That was an excerpt from The Rain's Came. <laughs> Another of the books we recommend you to read, especially during the next half hour. Meanwhile, for those who can't read, here is a sort of radio show which is Beyond Our Ken. Among those taking part are stock car driver Hemsley Cornflower, <laughs> the Honourable Delia Duff Whittington, Hugo Frampton and his musical jam jars. <laughs> Singit Poole, Miss Lottie Shoehorn. I'll bet she's easy to get on with. <laughs> to continue, Digger Whitelock, Yul Braden. <laughs> and of course, Mr. Kenneth Horn, who prefers to remain anonymous. Ladies and gentlemen, Kenneth Horn. <laughs> Hello, good evening, and welcome to Beyond Our Ken. Brilliant humour, good taste, breathtaking songs, scintillating wit and superb production. Well, those are just a few of the things we could do with on Beyond Our Ken. <laughs> While we're waiting, let me tell you some of the things I did last week. On Monday, I went down to Tunbridge Wells for the International Festival of Folk Music and Real Cool Morris Dancing, <laughs> which was being held in the Viennese room of Ziggy's Roller Skating Rink and Conservative Club. <laughs> And in case you're interested, the brass band section was won by the Chalfonts and Giles Distressed Gentlewomen's Military Music Ensemble <laughs> with a Lonnie Donegan arrangement of Does Your Chewing Gum Lose Its Flavour on the Bedpost Overnight and Circumstance. <laughs> the Corned Solo was played by the Honourable Amelia Woking Fitzmolton or, as she is affectionately known in the district, Old Hot Lips. <laughs> a, uh, a richly deserved title, as I discovered later. <laughs> However, on Friday, I was driving to the BBC when my car developed a mechanical defect. So, naturally, I drove into the nearest garage. <laughs> Good morning. I, I wonder if you could help me. Yes, yeah, certainly, sir. The scrap metal yard is in the next street. <laughs> Don't be rude about my car. It just wants a little attention, that's all. Well, I'm afraid I'm not familiar with that model. I've only been in the trade since 1927. <laughs> <laughs> I'd better call the governor. Uh, Mr. Nauksmore. Come in, Charlie. Now, then, what's easy to be the... Hello? Here, Charlie, nip inside and ring the police. <laughs> that car's been stolen from the Victoria and Albert Museum. <laughs> 
Yes, sir, it is. An old crook. Who's a car? <laughs> Monitor. You're a bit off course, ain't you? The others will be in Brighton by now. I'm not on the London to Brighton run now, then. Will you kindly find out what's wrong with it? I think it's something to do with the clutch. Every time I change gear, the chain flies off the ratchet. <laughs> All right, Charlie, let's have a bonnet up. Oh, lummy, Mr Larksmore. Just look at the engine. I bet that burns a lot of coke. <laughs> Hello, what's this? You've got a leak in your radiator. A leak? Oh, yes, I know. I was touring Wales the other week. They gave it me as a souvenir. <laughs> Just a minute. I think I found something. Yes. Oh, yes, there's a fault here in the ignition system. Well, what is it? The candle's gone out. <laughs> what did you say? I said the candle... Quiet, you fool. We're not here for our health. Well, sir, I'm afraid this is rather serious. There's definite signs of a major deterioration in the suction intake output, causing severe reverberation in the crankshaft casing. Oh, what does all that mean? About 50 pounds. <laughs> Fifty pounds? I've been offered that for the car. Well, I'm afraid that's our price, sir. Who were you thinking of getting to do the work? Lord Nuffield? Lord Nuffield! <laughs> 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 he only does weekends. <laughs> Look, sir, I'll tell you what I'll do. For the same money, I'll trim the wicks on your headlamps and give you a free 900,000 mile service. No. Mr Larksmore... Could I make a suggestion? If it's an expensive one, yes. Well, I was going to suggest that the gentleman might buy a new car. Charlie, this is your finest hour. You've justified all my faith in you. I knew I did the right thing when I stood bail for you. Charlie boy, pop and get a couple of brocures for the gentleman. Oh, right out, Mr Larksmore, right? Look, look, I don't want a new car. This one's perfectly sound. Begging your pardon, and with all due respect, but... If you was to give that car a good kick, like so... Well, the old thing will fall to pieces. <laughs> Hasn't it? Well, well. Yes, you know, that doesn't prove anything. I mean, look at this new super deluxe 1959 model car. If I gave this a good kick, like so. <laughs> you see, sir? <laughs> oh, just a lucky kick, sir. <laughs> Probably a faulty one, but you just try and do the same to one of these others. All right. Uh, was right, sir. Applies <laughs> to every model we've got in stock. Just look at the debris. <laughs> oh, Mr. Larksmore, I've, I've got the brooches. Oh, lummy. Have you had a lady driver in here? <laughs> Charlie, you any good at jigsaws? Well, I think I'd better be getting along now. I'll pick up my car later. <laughs> Oh, dear. No taxis, no buses in sight. Like a lift, Ken? Good heavens, it's Pat Lancaster. <laughs> What's a coincidence? Where are you going? I'm going to the BBC. Well, that's another coincidence. So am I. Well, jump in. <laughs> I've just been rehearsing my number in the car. In the car? What about the orchestra? Well, it's got a very large boot. <laughs> like to hear it now? Well, this show is full of coincidences. Sing, Pat. Jolly nice, Pat. Well, here we are at the BBC. And thanks for the musical lift. See you later. Bye.
Well, I hope I'm not late. Ah, there you are, Horn. I've had this new program we want you to do. In recent months, the BBC has become aware of the popularity of such programs as Mrs. Dale's Diary and The Archers. And now we've got plans for a new family series set in the frozen north. Oh, good heavens, a, a radio show on ice. Precisely. A simple story of Eskimo folk. I see. What are you going to call it? Uh, Eskimo Nell's Diary? <laughs> No, there was one suggestion. We call it Life with the Sea Lions, but we decided it was a bit near the knuckle. <laughs> so it'll be called simply The Nanooks. The Nanooks. <laughs> Sounds fascinating. Tell me more about it. Well, the whole thing is set in a little Eskimo village called Icebridge, and when the, when the program starts, the... Oh, Wake up! Oh, what is it now? You were snoring. Oh, I never snore. Must have been the wind. Shouldn't have eaten so much whale last night. <laughs> anyway, it's time to get up. It's February. <laughs> and there's work to be done. It's about time you fixed that hole in the roof. It's right over me head. No wonder I'm grey-haired. <laughs> Oh, not grey hair, that's frost. <laughs> and another thing, you always keep pulling the seal skins off me. So wonder I don't catch me death. This place is like an iceberg. From morning to night, I'm cold. Cold! Do you hear? Cold! 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 Oh, wrap up. <laughs> might ask. I haven't had a new fur coat since last spring. All right, Alice, all right. As it happens, I got you a new fur coat yesterday. It's outside. Oh, oh, Jan, you shouldn't have. Oh, well. Well, dear, let's see it then. Oh, there you are, my little darling. <laughs> well, you might have taken the bear out first. <laughs> what use is that bear to me? Well, um, Thought we might train him to do the housework. Well, you know what they say, a new broomer sweeps clean. <laughs> you just get that animated hearth rug out of here. We're overcrowded as it is. What with the children, the askies, and that old walrus in the corner. That's Uncle Ted. <laughs> well, it's about time you went. We can't turn him out just because he's getting a bit long in the tooth. But he never moves from that spot. Anybody'd think he was frozen to it. He probably is. <laughs> anyway, if anyone's going, it's Augustus. Look at him. You leave him alone. Leave him alone. He's my seal of merit. <laughs> yes, he was. He was given to me by the Institute of Good Igloo Keeping. They said I had the best soft rose in Greenland. <laughs> Hello? Who's that coming this hour of the year? Oh. oh, that'll be Rosemary's boyfriend, that nice young Mountie. Oh, I'll be calling you. <laughs> Rosemary? Yes, Mum? Nelson's here. <laughs> oh, he mustn't see me with me hair and icicles. Oh, come in. Come in, Nelson. She won't be a minute. Hello, Mr. and Mrs. Nanook. <laughs> It's a nice little igloo you got here. Yes. Ours is an ice house, ours is. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right, Nelson, take your polar ice cap off and make yourself at home. Yes, uh, have a good journey. No, here, what do you think? What? Well, I got the dog team harnessed up, and when I said, gee up, they just laughed in me face. <laughs> you should have said mush. Oh, right, they laughed at me mush. <laughs> Hello, Nelson. Oh, Rosemary, I love you. Come, let me put my arm round your Arctic waist. <laughs> Give us a kiss. Oh, and your nose cold. <laughs> 
Wilson, do you know have you been keeping? Tell you the truth, I ain't been too good. Oh, I went to Dr. Iceberg about it, and you know, I've got one of the rarest complaints in the Arctic Circle. I'll bet it painful for you. No. <laughs> No, it's not messing about. <laughs> he, he told me he never come across it before. Oh, Nelson, whatever is it? Prickly eat. <laughs> no, here. Come on. Rosemary, what should we do? Let's go up to the west end of the ice floe and watch the northern lights. That's mm. right, Rosemary. Show him the aurora borealis. Oh, I can hardly wait. <laughs> Well, Alice, I'm off. Give us me harpoons. There you are, dear. Going fishing? No, I'm going down to the whale at anchor. We've got a darts match on. <laughs> bye, Jen. Oh, bye. by the way, bring some candles home with you tonight. Okay. We've got nothing for supper. <laughs> oh, well, I must get on with the glue work. Oh, well, that's got the bed made. Now I better just... Come in! Oh, good morning, uh, Mrs. Nanook. Yes. Of 23 Glacier Avenue, Icebridge. That's right. Well, I am from the news of the Eskimo world. Oh. Oh. Oh, oh, sit down, won't you? Uh, like a cup of blubber and a pemmican sandwich. <laughs> oh, no, thank you. Well, Mrs. Nanook, it's my pleasant duty to tell you that you've won first prize in our Guess How Much of the Iceberg is Underwater contest. Oh! Oh, are that really? Yes, yes. Oh. Oh, what is the prize? Well, well, it's something that no housewife should be without. I therefore have pleasure in presenting you with this. Oh! Oh, I say! Oh, what even is it? A refrigerator. <laughs> and now here are four other people who were once asked to do their act on ice, but it fell through. Anyhow, I'm sure that uh, sure that you'll melt too when you hear the Fraser Hayes Fall. This old man, he played one, he played knick-knack on my drum. Knick-knack, paddy-whack, give the dog a bone. This old man came rolling home. This old man, he played two, he played knick-knack on my shoe. Knick-knack, paddy-whack, give the dog a bone. This old man came rolling home. And so to the Kenneth Horn documentary feature, Hornorama. Yes, once again, Kenneth Horn and his team of investigators bring you a factual report on topics of immediate interest. And tonight we present a close-up on the summer. Are we in for a good summer? Well, I think so. The rain's getting decidedly warmer. <laughs> Well, now, first, let's ask some ordinary people their plans for the summer. How about you, sir? Well, speaking for myself, I can't stand the scorching sun. It's all right for some people, sunning themselves on the sand and listening to the waves lapping on the seashore, but not for me. <laughs> Still, I've got a special system for keeping cool, especially when it's oppressive. Oh, yes, what's that? Well, I just slip down to the railway station and stand in front of the people waving goodbye. <laughs> And now, how about you, madam? Well, I shall stay at home this year, you see. Because last year I went to Switzerland, but, I, well, I, I was most disappointed. Oh, why? Well, all those mountains completely hide the view, you see. <laughs> yes, well, well, now, the, uh, one of the features of the English summer is crickets. Crickets. So let's have a word with one. <laughs> And good day to you, too. <laughs> now, tell us, sir, uh, where do you live? Oh, yes, of course, on the hearth. <laughs> now, I understand you make that sound by rubbing your back legs together. That's your way of making conversation. Well, now, uh, what do you do for a living? <laughs> oh, you do impressions. Would you like to do one for us now? Good. Well, off you go. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> oh, yes. 
Yes, of course, a bow-legged cricket having a chat. <laughs> Very, very good, too. Now, do another impression. Um, do a, a, a grasshopper. No, why not? Oh, yes, of course, I see. It isn't cricket. <laughs> well, thank you very much for being with us. And the same to you. Thank you. Well, Now, another popular feature of the summer months is the Wimbledon fortnight, and tonight we're happy to have with us one of the lesser-known British representatives, Mr. Arnold Fancourt. Hello, anyone for tennis? <laughs> well, Mr. Fancourt, how's your tennis going? Oh, back and forth, you know. <laughs> one sport, you can have a deuce of a time sometimes. Yes. Well, tell us something about your career. Certainly. Well, after when I was eight years old, the painter used to play tennis with me every day. And why did he stop playing with you when you were eight? I don't know. He probably thought it would be easier to use a racket. Oh, I see. But that, uh... <laughs> didn't that uh, deter you? Oh, no. No, no, no. Good gracious, no. <laughs> well, I knew it put me off a bit. And then I met a girl called Liz. A real love match, you might say. Oh, she was a wizard tennis arm. Yes, I suppose she taught you all you know. Yes, yeah, so we play tennis too. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, but we were we were talking about a particular sport. Well, that was Liz, all right. <laughs> uh, a very particular girl, you know. Only goes out with friends and strangers. <laughs> Anyway, Mr. Pankow, one last question. How do you think you'll do in this year's championship? Well, I think I can safely say I shall positively terrify my competitors with my very unusual forehand drive. What's so unusual about it? I use all four hands. <laughs> Thank you, and good luck, Mr. Fancourt. Well, now, rare though it may be, if we do get a really hot summer, one thing you can be sure of, the national press will be full of stories of... Pavement hot enough to fry eggs on. But has it ever actually been done? We sent Cecil Snaith to find out. Well, listeners, I'm standing now in German Street in London's fashionable clubland. The sun is beating down from a cloudless sky, providing absolutely ideal frying conditions. <laughs> I'm now going to break the egg onto the pavement. Now, not only am I frying an egg, but I've also brought along some rashes of bacon, a sausage, and a rather nice piece of loafah. Quite a little feast. Oh. But it seems to be working. They're all cooking nicely on the pavement, and the smell is delicious. In fact, I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, excuse me, sir, but what exactly is going on here? Oh, hello, Constable. I, I, I'm just cooking a little... Yeah, so I see. Well, what do you think this is, an open-air cafeteria? <laughs> No, come on, come on, my lad, you're coming with me. Uh, just a minute, you don't understand. I'm from the BBC. Yes, so we've heard all that before. Now, come on, into the van. This is Cecil Snaith from behind a mixed grill in Bow Street, returning to <laughs> the studio. And thank you, Cecil Snaith, for that guide on eating out in London. To most people, however, the summer means the seaside, and at any of our popular coastal resorts, the visitor can always find his pleasures on the seafront. Any more for a skylark? Any more for a skylark? I say, excuse me, miss, but don't you mean any more for the skylark? I know what I mean. <laughs> Sorry, well, look, when you're finished, how about coming with me to the petting green? Surely you mean putting green. I know what I mean. <laughs> or, on the other hand, many people nowadays find considerable enjoyment in taking out one of those little pedal boats for the afternoon. Ambrose. Yes, Felicity. <laughs> Cool, it is out here at sea, mm -hmm. just drifting along mm -hmm. aimlessly from wave to wave. Uh, shut up and pedal. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ambrose, but I'm getting rather tired. Well, what's the matter with you? We've only been out for six hours. <laughs> <laughs> Look, look, Andrews, there's another 
of those big ships. Oh, I do wish they wouldn't come so close. Oh. Get out of his is our right of way. Oh, oh Ambrose, oh. I, I'm getting frightened. Yeah. Let's go in now, dear. Oh, fine sailor you are. Oh, really? oh or I just spoiled school. I'm sorry, oh, I was really enjoying it, laying back here under the parasol with me hand trailing in the cool water. <laughs> So never mind, there's always tomorrow. Oh, look, look, Andrews. There's the man on the beach waving to us. All eh? right, mister, we're coming in. Yes, we yes. know our time's up. That's right. Let's go. 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 Felicity. Yes, Ambrose. I didn't know they spoke French in Ramsgate. <laughs> Well, there'll be another horn armor next week when the subject will be lovers on hillsides. Are they romantically inclined? <laughs> also, in next week's program, there'll be a talk on the decline of the cinema industry, illustrated by lantern slides. <laughs> and we'll be going over to the headquarters of the Leather Workers Guild for their international festival of popular thong. <laughs> we'll be showing you an excerpt from the new film which deals with the delivery of butter during hot weather and called Some Came Running. <laughs> so, until next week then, this is Kenneth Horne saying goodbye for now and leaving you with this thought. Does a tongue twister get your tang all tangled up? <laughs> no guide. <laughs> You have always been listening to What Have Just Missed, Beyond Our Ken, a sort of recorded radio show which gave employment to Kenneth Horne and also to Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Betty Marsden, Bill Pertwee, Patricia Lancaster, the Fraser Hayes Four and the BBC Variety Orchestra conducted by Paul Fennelly. The script, believe it or not, was written and letters of complaint should be sent to Eric Merriman and Barry Took. However, the onus must inevitably fall on our producer, Jake Sprout. <laughs> Bindweed! Bindweed! Where is that gardener? Oh, here I am, sir. Over here. What are you doing, pulling up my best flowers? Why, money stock taking. <laughs> well, sir, I, I found a good spot for the rhododendrons. Planted them in that big patch of red earth at the side of the house. You green-fingered nitwit! That's a tennis court. <laughs> oh, oh I, I thought that net was to keep the birds away. <laughs> Just look at this garden, absolutely choked with weeds. I thought I told you to pull up that dead shrub. Well, I couldn't move it, sir. Couldn't move it, you lazy good-for-nothing. I'll, I'll soon show you. Here, I, I, I'd better give you an answer. <laughs> it's no good, it won't budge. Well, that was an excerpt from Deep Are the Roots. <laughs> Another of the books we recommend you to read, especially during the next half hour. <laughs> Meanwhile, for those who can't read, here is a sort of radio show which is beyond our ken. Among those taking part are Wheelwright Amberley Grotefield, Mrs. Nift, the House of Commons yo-yo team, <laughs> George and Lily Brisket, sisters with a difference, <laughs> Coloratura soprano Mildred Gasto. I bet she's got a good range. <laughs> To continue, Carissima Rogers, Maverick Scott Johnston, and of course Mr. Kenneth Horne, who prefers to remain anonymous. Ladies and gentlemen, Kenneth Horne. Hello, good evening, and welcome to Beyond Our Ken, the show that makes you want to jump for joy. That's if she's in the room with you. Well, now I've had a busy week as usual. On Monday, I wrote a fan letter to Bridget Bardo. Well, I expect she has quite a lot of admirers, but my love for her is rather different. I'm after her money. 
On Tuesday, I was invited to be the liaison officer of the Suspension Bridge Society, a sort of go-between, I suppose. However, I couldn't accept because my time is rather taken up these days. I have a special duty to perform at the meeting of our local ladies' sewing circle. I'm the chief croupier. <laughs> On Thursday... I was asked to go and see our producer, Jakes Brown, who wanted me to, to give him a reference on his application for a passport. Well, apparently the Foreign Office are not too keen on letting BBC people out of the country uh, in case they come back again. <laughs> However, on Friday, I decided to stay at home and indulge in my latest hobby, songwriting. That night, that magic night in June, in June. Uh, Prudence. Yes, sir. What rhymes with June? Oh, spoon, sir. Oh, I never thought of that. Thank you, Prudence. That magic night in June. Oh, we stood beneath the silver spoon. <laughs> No, it doesn't seem quite right, Prudence. Perhaps October would be better. That magic night in October, you looked so different sober. <laughs> there, is that better? Well, sir, can I be frank? Well, of course you can. I prefer you as Prudence, but... Uh... <laughs> well, now, what, what, what do you think? Well, sir, this songwriting of yours, with all due deference to your creative abilities and your devoted patronage of the arts, and with the greatest respect, sir, I should stick to your crochet work. <laughs> Have a cup of coffee, you'll feel better. Oh, oh, sorry, sir, truly. Oh, Prudence, look what you've done. You spilt the coffee all over my music. There's blobs everywhere. Oh, I hope I haven't destroyed a masterpiece. Well, Prudence, you might at least. Ah, just a minute. Thank you, Prudence, for spilling that coffee. I shall call it, My Love for You is Instant. <laughs> my love for you is instant. I've got grounds for loving you. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, I'll go, sir. Oh, you mean Oscar Berlin the second? That's right. Good morning, Mr. Orn. <laughs> yeah, I say I'm mad about your door chimes. <laughs> oh, thank you. It's one of my earlier compositions. Yeah. <laughs> no, but come on. Now, let's have a look at your songwriting efforts. Ooh, 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 these lyrics are a bit saucy. That's my diary. <laughs> Here's the song here. Oh, right. Uh, Magic Night in October, you look so different sober. Oh, no, no, I'm afraid not. Oh, what's the matter with it? It's been done. I mean, it's all right to lift ideas from other composers, but you must give them a bit of a twist. Look at some of my hit songs. A nightingale sang in printing our square. <laughs> we'll gather ox. <laughs> and of course, smoke gets in your ears. I see. Well, now look, Mr. Berlin, what exactly is wrong with my song? Well, I've told you before, Mr. Orne, there are several successful ingredients for a popular song. First, you must have a touch of sentiment. Mm -hmm. You can't go wrong with a dear old lady. No, I shouldn't want to. I yeah. don't know. <laughs> oh. Oh. Uh, no, stop messing about. <laughs> now, you've got that. A bit yeah. of pathos. Now, the next thing you must remember is that nowadays a spot of uh, Latin American rhythm is essential. Yes, yes, I'm with you there. Yeah, good. And finally, people don't want to be miserable. So it should also contain a humorous thought or two, you see. Yes, yes, thank you. Now, just give me a moment, will you? Mm, all right. Uh, mm. I, look, I've got it. Now, how's this? Mm. My grey-haired mother cha-chas on the bedpost overnight. <laughs> That's it. It's marvellous. What a hit. Just wait and see. Billy Cotton will go mad when he hears that. <laughs> oh, yes. I guarantee that within two weeks, you'll have a song entered for the International Festival of Unpopular Songs. <laughs> and if it should win, you know what that means. Now what? Enough money to give up songwriting and go into an honest business. Prudence! Oh, oh, Prudence, there you are. Isn't it exciting? I've got a good chance of getting a song into the International Festival. Oh, do you think you'll sing it, sir? Well, I shall sing it myself. Now, let, let me see. It's something haunting, I think. It will be when you've murdered it. That's enough, Prudence. 
now, plenty of coffee. Even though we're far apart, but listen to turn be your steel. Song number 3204. <laughs> Remember the title, My Devonshire Mama. <laughs> and the title of the next entry is Music is Better Than Words, which is to be sung by. Good heavens, Pat Lancaster. <laughs> From the birds, music is better than words, much better than words. Jolly nice, Pat. Oh, what am I saying? I'm next. Jolly good luck, Ken. Oh, thank you. You've heard of the old lamplighter and the old umbrella man But neither of these is quite as old as the old sandwich board man Strolling down the street with a smile for everyone he meets Everybody knows Dan, Dan, the sandwich board man. As he shuffles on his round, the passers by applaud. But his feet are firmly on the ground. He never gets bored. His cheery smile will banish gloom. Though his board says, prepare to meet thy doom, he's Dan, Dan, the sandwich board man. Well, that was the last song in the All-British Final. And I'm just getting the result from our panel of judges, who, as you'll remember, are Sir Mortimer Wheeler, the Aga Khan, Dame Sybil Fondyke, and Walter Gabriel. <laughs> and yes, here it is, the winning song is The Sandwich Board Man. <laughs> and this means that this song has been voted the finest song that Britain can produce to compete in the international contest next week at Monte Carlo. Therefore, Mr. Kenneth Horne will be going over there to represent us, so bad luck, Pearl Carr and Teddy Johnson. <laughs> oh well, Monte Carlo, here I come. And the second prize goes to that music link. Oh, hello, Mr. Horn. Welcome to Monte. Oh, I say, he's not here, is he? <laughs> and, uh, by the way, my name is Lancelot Carlyle, and I'm in charge of the British contingent. The British contingent? Yes, you and me. <laughs> now, look here, we must stick together. These foreigners aren't to be trusted. <laughs> oh, they're up to all sorts of mischief. Well, come on, Mr. Horn, let's get over to the British headquarters. It's all been arranged for us by the Foreign Office. <laughs> Yes, well, it's a cosy little beach hut, really. Uh, what about some tea? Good idea. I... Oh, bother, there's a hole in the kettle. I bet that's the work of the Valari gang. <laughs> Look, you stay here. I'll uh, hop off and get you a new one. Ah, oh, well, now here's a good chance to rehearse. Oh, what, no piano? Just had a basket, I suppose. You've heard of the old lamplighter. Uh, come in. Good evening. 
Now I'm sorry to trouble you, but I wondered whether you could lend me a pair of swimming trunks. <laughs> Hello, there's something fishy here. I bet you... <laughs> I bet she's a spy from the French contingent. You must not suspect that I am a spy from the French contingent. I bet she's after a crafty peep at my song. I'd give anything for a crafty peep at his song. She'll be lucky. Monsieur, what are you mumbling about? I was going to ask you the same thing. Monsieur, you are very handsome. And suddenly I have a strange, irresistible urge to run my fingers through your... Oh, well, perhaps not. <laughs> And what do you want with me, madam? Nothing, nothing. I'm just being sociable. Monsieur, I need soothing. Sing to me. Oh, all right, but well, what shall I sing? The song that you are going to sing in the International Festival of Popular Song. All oh, right, well, ah, oh, just a minute. I'm onto your game. I know who you are. Sacre bleu! I underestimated you, monsieur. I should think you did. Well, Madam X, you can just go back to your boss and tell him from me the British song doesn't leave my throat until Thursday night. Curses to foiled! Oh, well. Well, I better unpack my chunk. Good heavens, what are you doing in there? Stay where you are, English dog. You are looking down the barrel of a 45 caliber slide trombone. <laughs> One move and I'll blast you to hell. Who are you? I'm Hermann Stump. <laughs> Musical director of the German contingent. Now hand over your song. Never. Very well. I do not wish to use such drastic methods of torture, but you leave me no choice. Do your worst. Very well. One, two. No, 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 stop, I surrender, I surrender, I'll give you what you want. All right, stump drum the trombone. <laughs> These bagpipes are pointing straight at your ear. <laughs> Any funny business and I'll play you a chorus of Scotland the Brave. <laughs> now get out of here! Carlyle, thank heaven you came when you did. Things are moving fast now, Horn. Huh? I'm afraid I've got some bad news. I managed to break into the committee rooms and get an advanced copy of the programme. It's sabotage! What do you mean? They've got a foreign pianist accompanying you. Good heavens, who? Semprini. <laughs> I told you they'd stop at nothing. But don't worry, Horn. I won't leave your side until after the contest. We'll win through somehow. And the sandwich holes. Three. Well done. Jolly good shot. <laughs> well, that was the British entry. Rotten, wasn't it? <laughs> and now here is the Italian entry. Signor Prego singing his own composition, Minestrone. <laughs> Minestrone, oh, oh. Minestrone, oh, oh. You take some lentils and rice, potatoes cut like a dice. Then you cook them and cook them and cook them and cook them until they taste awfully nice. Minestrone, oh, oh. minestrone, oh, oh. It makes your heart loop the loop, a Neapolitan boop boop a doop. That's a minestrone. It's Italian for soup. And by, by the unanimous verdict of all Italian audience, minestrone is the winner. Oh, bad luck, Mr. Horn. But you didn't disgrace the old country by coming in 25th. Oh, thank you, sir. I must admit he won fairly. I think I ought to congratulate him. Uh, Senor Frigo. Here. 
Just a minute. I say, Carlyle, this man's an imposter. It's an obvious disguise. I knew there'd be dirty work somewhere. All right, the game's up, whoever you are. What have you got to say now about the winning song? Well, I told you, in London, it's all right if you give him a bit of a twist. <laughs> And now here are four people who are always giving songs a bit of a twist, and very nicely they twist them too. For instance, this week they've pre-recorded their accompaniment, and now somehow they're going to fit a song to it. So stand by for a double portion of the Fraser Hayes Four, which, unless I'm mistaken, makes, let's see, eight. Sing along, sing along, sing along, Josie. Sing along, sing along, sing along, Josie. Sing along, sing along, sing along, Josie. Hey, sing along, sing along, Joe. Hey, sing along, sing along, Joe. Hey, sing along, Joe. Sing, sing along, sing along, Josie. Sing along, sing along, sing along, Joe. And so to the Kenneth Horn documentary feature, Hornorama. Yes, once again, Kenneth Horne and his team of investigators bring you a factual report on topics of immediate interest. And tonight, we present a close-up on water. Just a few reflections. Well, now, what would we be without water? Filthy. <laughs> Little do we realise the big part that water plays in our lives. You speak for yourself. <laughs> Well, I see. Yes, I think I see. Now, what of the, what of the romantic associations of water? Now, here's a lady who's just come back from our honeymoon. Madam, I, I believe you went to Niagara. Yes. Yes, that's right. Lovely place to go for a honeymoon. Yes. Now, what did you think of Niagara Falls? Falls? What falls? <laughs> Yes, yes. <laughs> Finally, a very important use of water, cleansing. Now, let's have a word with a, a borough cleansing operative. What's your name, sir? A Stanley Birkinshaw, <laughs> a Sidcup Borough Council. Yes. What exactly is your job? Well, every morning, just as dawn is streaking across the sky, I slip out of the house and proceed round the district spraying the streets. <laughs> oh, you mean on, on, uh, on one of those water carts? No. By myself. <laughs> and thank you very much, Mr. Birkinshaw, for laying the dust in the studio. <laughs> now then, water, water. Well, apart from its many practical uses, water can also give a great deal of pleasure. And in recent years, underwater sports such as skin diving have become tremendously popular. Really, CD? Yes, Ambrose? Where, where are my flippers? <laughs> You've got them on your feet, Ambrose. Oh, oh, so I am. I thought me toenails needed cutting. <laughs> well, Ambrose, dear, how do I look? Can I be honest? You look like the creature from the Black Lagoon. <laughs> That's not very nice, Ambrose, dear. No, don't forget, you started me off on this frogman's luck. Yeah, but you take it too far, sitting in the bulrushes all day, croaking. <laughs> and look at your, and look at your oxygen cylinders. <laughs> with the man well, I keep telling you they're supposed to go outside your costume <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, then. come on then get your harpoon <laughs> and off we go on another adventure into the mysterious depths I've changed my mind Ambrose I don't think I'll go in today, oh, dear. Oh, Felicity, why not? It's too crowded here in the children's paddling pool. <laughs> yes, water has a fascination for most of us, particularly such famous underwater explorers as Hans and Lottie Huss. 
We sent Cecil Snaith under the Red Sea to interview. Well, hello, listeners. I'm speaking to you from inside a diving suit on the bottom of the Red Sea. From where I'm standing, I can see a shoal of multicolored fish. And outside the helmet, there are even more. <laughs> well, now, Hans and Lottie haven't actually arrived yet, but when they do, they've promised to show me some of the denizens of the deep, particularly the giant whale, which is rarely seen in these waters. I understand that the whale is quite friendly and spends most of his time lying on the ocean bed. And <laughs> here's a funny thing. He, he sleeps with his mouth open. <laughs> I wonder if he snores. Oh, of course, it's mainly with the hope that unsuspecting fish will swim in. So now, until they arrive, let me describe some of the beauties of the underwater world. Over there is a vivid patch of coral. Here, a pretty cluster of sea anemones. Oh, and just here, I've spotted an underwater cave. It's, it's rather dark inside, but I'll, I'll venture in and see whether I... Uh... <laughs> Oh. And this is Cecil Jonas Neith returning you to the studio. Finally, let us consider those who earn their living from the sea, those weather-beaten old salts who brave the cruel sea in all weathers for the sake of a good catch, the fishermen of England. Hello, Rodney. Hello, Charles. <laughs> Welcome aboard. Nice place you've got here. Yes, it's nice, isn't it? I caught it this morning. <laughs> Is that all you caught? Yes, I haven't seen a soul all day. <laughs> I say, Charles, I hear you've got a new net. Any good? Rather. When there's a gale blowing, it rarely keeps my hair in place. <laughs> but, uh, what about you, Rothers? Oh, well, I've been going out to help the herring fleet. Oh, you mean a sort of herring aid? Oh. <laughs> oh, you are a nautical wag. Still, I enjoy it. I just love to hear them say, there he goes, the best fisherman in the whole fleet. Oh, Rodney, you're always fishing for compliments. <laughs> well, I'd better cast off. Shall I give you a hand? No, 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 I can manage. There. Oh, Charles, it's quite the best pullover you've ever knitted. <laughs> There'll be another Horner Armour next week when the subject will be Teapot Manufacturers Has Business Gone Up the Spout? <laughs> also in next week's programme, there'll be a talk given by a rose growing expert called Never Give a Sucker an Even Break. We'll be going over to the Shepton Mallet Apple Eating Contest for the week's good cause. <laughs> and there'll be an excerpt from the comic opera about a man with itching powder down his back called Rigoletto. <laughs> So until next week then, this is Kenneth Horne saying goodbye for now and leaving you with this thought from a listener. If you told a secret to a rat catcher, would he keep his trap shut? Good night. <laughs> You have either been listening to or have just missed Beyond Our Ken, a sort of recorded radio show which gave employment to Kenneth Horn and also to Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Betty Marsden, Bill Pertwee, Patricia Lancaster, the Fraser Hayes Four and the BBC Review Orchestra conducted by Harry Rabinowitz. The script, believe it or not, was written and letters of complaint should be sent to Eric Merriman and Barry Took. However, the onus must inevitably fall on our producer, Jakes Brown. <laughs> Take over, will you? Just going on my nightly rounds. Hello, Captain. Good evening, miss. I wonder whether you care to sit at my table for dinner. I'd love to. Thank you, Captain. Good. See you later, then. Oh, hello, Captain. Good evening, miss. I just wanted to ask you if you'd save me three or four dances this evening. Of course, Captain. Good. See you later, then. Some. Why, hello, Captain. What is it this time? You're nothing. I just wondered if you'd like me to show you the engine room. Mm, I just adore it. And shall we say midnight? 
I'll be there. Good. See you later. Oh, my word. I can see I'm going to enjoy this voyage. That was an excerpt from The Sea Wolf. <laughs> Another of the books we recommend you to read, especially during the next half hour. <laughs> Meanwhile, for those who can't read, here is a sort of radio show which is beyond our ken. Among those taking part are Sapper Stitchmore, the Honourable Agnew Counterblast, the pipes and drums of the Anglo-Persian Oil Company, <laughs> Wedgwood Nift, Miss Winifred Watchmaker. I mean, you can have a good time with her. <laughs> to continue, Con Macaroni, Sir Farley Blenkinsop Capone. And of course, Mr. Kenneth Horne, who prefers to remain anonymous. Ladies and gentlemen, Kenneth Horne. Hello, good evening. Welcome to Beyond Our Canon. First, I should like to thank you for all the letters you write. One this week was from a listener who said he never misses our show. The letter actually reads Dear Kenneth Horne, I haven't heard your show for weeks and I never miss it. <laughs> We were all deeply touched. However, let me, as usual, tell you some of the things I did last week. On Monday, I popped over to the police sports of the White City, particularly fascinated by the main event of the evening, six policemen in different coloured helmets chasing an electric burglar. <laughs> on Tuesday, I had to go to the library because my wife insisted on my taking back the book I was reading. She said she just wouldn't have books like that about the house. It was called How to Be Master in Your Own Home. <laughs> Wednesday, I was going down to the high street when a ragged old champ asked me for money. I gave him every penny I had on me. Well, I just couldn't refuse his honest and forthright approach. I think it was the way he said, Your money or your life. <laughs> Thursday, I went to bed early, but I had a very restless night. I dreamt I was counting sheep and kept waking up. Friday... <laughs> Friday was a day of surprising peace, and I'm glad to say the peace I surprised was rather pleased. <laughs> However, on Friday evening, I'd been invited to the midnight premiere of a new film by one of our promising young actors, Edmund Harvey. Before the film, he took me to dinner at London's leading theatrical restaurant, The Creeper. <laughs> Dear, why are these actor chappies always late? Hello, Kenneth. Yes, I am late. Right, Good. in we go. Oh, just a tick. I've forgotten something. I say, why are you putting those uh, dark glasses on? I don't want to be recognised. <laughs> Come on. Oh, good evening. A table for Mr. Edmund Harvey. Certainly, sir. Who for to me? I say, Kenneth. I think you'd better have the dark glasses. <laughs> You're at table, sir. Uh, thank you, Luigi. We'll start with the soup. Uh, very good, sir. Uh, would you care for a roll? Oh, uh, let me see. No, no, I don't think I like that one. No, nor that one. No, 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 thank you. Take them away. Well, what's the matter? Nothing. It's just that these days it's so difficult to find a roll that suits me. <laughs> <laughs> I say, I say, Edmund, just look at all those celebrities here. That couple over there, isn't that Sir Nosbert and Lady Lumsden? So it is. My word, that mink must be worth a fortune. Yes, and she's rather well-dressed, too. <laughs> Quick, Horn! Get behind the menu. No hurt. It's too late. He's spotted us. Who? That dreadful Grant Faversham is coming over. Just can't bear the sight of him. Hello, Grant. How oh, nice to see you. <laughs> it's been about ten years since we met. I don't think I'd have recognized you if it hadn't been for the suit. <laughs> And you, Grant, I see you've got a beard now. Yes, I have to grow it for my next part. <laughs> really? What are you advertising? <laughs> it's for my new play. Come to the first night and bring a friend, if you have one. <laughs> I'm afraid I can't do that, but I'll come to the second night, if there is one. <laughs> By the way, this is uh, Kenneth Horn, Grant Faversham. How do you do? Now, tell us about this new play of yours. Uh, it's rather divine, really. At last I found a play that really suits my personality. What is it, the wooden horse? <laughs> <laughs> 
in it I played the part of a rather lovable old man who befriends a somewhat sensitive young boy and helps him find the way out of some very awkward situations. Uh, what's it called? Big Ears Gets Naughty Out of Trouble. <laughs> Big ears. Bye-bye, big head. <laughs> well, 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 I suppose you'd call him one of the greats. Yes, he does, rather. <laughs> oh, look, Kenneth, this would be interesting. Two film starlets about to meet head-on. Oh, where? Over there. Violet Haywood and June Limerick with their press agents. <laughs> you just listen. Hello, darling. How nice to see you. Hello, darling. How nice to see you. Saw your last film. It was wonderful. Saw your last film. It was wonderful. We've done very well since you were Miss Ramsgate of 1951. And you were Miss Scarborough of 1939. 1949, dear. <laughs> Sorry, darling. My mistake. Mistake? You've done that deliberately. No, dear. Did that deliberately. Sorry. You did that deliberately. No, I never. No, I didn't. Well, one of us did. <laughs> Shh. Here comes Grand Favisham. Oh, hello, you two. Fancy seeing you both here. You're doing a film together. No, no we, we are, are just good friends. friends. That's all. <laughs> Well, Edmund, that's interesting, but you know, I've never seen those two in a film. Well, of course you haven't. They don't make films. They're far too busy opening fates. <laughs> Hello, here's another young lady coming to the table. She appears to know you. Well, I wonder who it can be, said with surprise. Good heavens, it's Pat Lancaster. <laughs> Hello, Ken. How nice to see you. Oh, don't let's start that again. Sing, Pat. Love defies description. Love Charlie Nice, Pat. So that's what love is. I've always wondered. I say, Miss Lancaster, there's something I've been dying to ask you. Well, go ahead. No, I don't like to. Oh, come now, Edmund. You're acting like a coward. Oh, all right, then. Miss Lancaster, would you let me give you my autograph? <laughs> Certainly. You no, know, I'll do better than that. Here's a signed photograph. Well, let's have a look. Oh, good gracious, how young it makes you look. Lying there on your tummy on a bearskin rug. <laughs> when was that taken? Last week. Eh? Oh, only the head and shoulders, of course. Oh, well, thanks, Mr. Harvey. Bye, Ken. Bye. Sean. Yes? How would you like to meet one of England's most successful young playwrights? I'd love to. Well, now's your chance. Here she comes. Excuse me, love, have you got a light? <laughs> Miss root has gone out. Well, by all means, here you are. Well, Ken, this is Miss Sheena Malarkey. <laughs> her first play has made her a fortune. Well, congratulations. How do you like being rich? Hey, it's lovely. I'm really enjoying a taste of money. <laughs> Perhaps you'd care to join us in a drink? Yeah, I would that. I'll have a pint of mild. <laughs> and ask the landlord if he's got any crisps. <laughs> Well, Sheila, how did you come to write this first play of yours? Well, I happened to go and see a play once by some fella called William Shakespeare. And I thought to myself, well, if I can't write a better play than that, then the sum it up. <laughs> and uh, didn't you like Shakespeare? No, I didn't. It weren't even proper English. It weren't it? No, it wasn't. Oh, sorry, it wasn't it? <laughs> no, it weren't. Oh. <laughs> On your road, I sat down there and then I wrote it. Had it finished my clothes in time. Sent it straight off to workshop. Oh, yes, the theatre workshop. No, Carpenter's workshop. <laughs> they acted it about a bit and put in some vice. And Bob's your uncle, it was a great success. Yes, uh, <laughs> so I believe, isn't it full of lust, greed and sex? Ah, it's just a simple tale of country folk. <laughs> I say, Kenneth, just look at the time. We'll be late for the film premiere. Oh, are you going to that? Yes, we are. Ah, uh, take me in with you, will you? Well, if you like, but why? Well, it's a certificate X. <laughs> Well, personally, I'm, uh, I'm quite looking forward to it. They say it's even more angry than look back in anger. What's it called? Look out, I'm livid. <laughs> it's, um, 
It's the story of a frustrated young man who thinks the whole world is against him. Sarah, where is Jeremy? No, dear, I think he received a letter with some bad news this morning. The last I saw of him, he went outside with a gun. Sarah, you don't think he... No, dear, nothing like that. He said something to me about getting the postman. <laughs> I tell you, I'm worried about that boy. He does nothing all day long but stay in his room and play darts. Well, a lot of young men do that. Yes, dear, but not poison darts. <laughs> I'm beginning to think something's upsetting him. Well, there you are, Jeremy. Had a good day, dear. Questions! Questions! All the time it's questions. Why can't you leave me alone? Why do you want to pick on me? Oh, what a cruel place this world is. It makes me seethe. My boy, what are you so angry about? I don't know, father. And that's what makes me so angry. <laughs> Jeremy, dear, now come along and have a nice spoonful of gripe water. <laughs> Must you always treat me like a child? It's no good I'm stifling in this atmosphere. I've just got to get away from it all. I'm leaving home, dear. Year. I'm leaving home! <laughs> We'll close the door after you. <laughs> I knew you'd try to stand in my way. But I'm going... Forever? Maybe even longer. Goodbye. Don't worry, dear. He'll be back. Pity. <laughs> Brighton. Brighton Station. Huh. Isn't that typical? I wanted to go to Southampton. <laughs> tickets, please. Ah, tickets. Ah, tickets, meaningless bits of paper. Oh, you haven't got one. No, of course I haven't. Do I look stupid? Besides, I didn't ask to come here. Well, in that case, young fellow, my lad, I'm afraid you're in for. I find you guilty of travelling without a ticket and sentence you to a fine of 30 shillings. I couldn't care less. <laughs> and what's more, you're a worthless piece of flotsam, Your Honour. <laughs> you're a rotten, vicious, cruel, horrid, nasty, a degenerate product of this so-called civilization. Well, nobody's perfect. <laughs> Next case. Christabel, thank heaven for you. I'm glad we met. You're the only one who understands me. The only one I feel I can trust. The only one who ever listens to me. <laughs> Don't interrupt. <laughs> All the time, frustration and betrayal. It makes me bitter, I tell you. Bitter, bitter, bitter. Here you are, sir. Three bitters. <laughs> you keep out of this. As it's your birthday today, Jeremy, I bought you a present. Nobody has to give me anything. But I know you just love these. Here, take them. Oh, well, if I must, I must. Oh, oh my favourites, acid drops. <laughs> So, you come home at last, Jeremy. Yes, Father. I've been taking a look at life, and I've decided now on the thing that's right for me to do. Good for you, son. What's that? I've decided to write a book, a book that will express my own personality, a book that will explain my attitude towards life. Splendid idea. Have you a title in mind? Yes, I shall call it How to Win Friends and Influence People. <laughs> And now here are four people who always have a soothing influence and win many friends with musical numbers such as Blow the Man Down. So here are the Fraser Hayes Four. Oh, 
down Oh, give me some time To blow the man down And so to the Kenneth Horn documentary feature Hornorama Yes, once again, Kenneth Horne and his team of investigators bring you a factual report on topics of immediate interest. And tonight we present a close-up on ships. Do British ships lead the world? Or is that just a shipping line? <laughs> well, first of all, let's have a word with somebody who has spent all his life in ships. And your name, sir? Abel Seaman Stanley Birkinshaw of the SS Salty Sioux. Yes. <laughs> How do you like a life at sea? Oh, simply splendid. I find it so stimulating being at sea with a salty tang in your nostrils and the feel of the spray in your face. <laughs> yes, I know what you mean. <laughs> but um, tell me, what job do you do? Well, just at present, I'm a steward, but I used to be a stoker, first class. Uh, they insisted that I transferred. Oh, why was that? Uh, weren't you any good at stoking? Oh, yes, but every time I shouted full steam ahead, I put the fire out. <laughs> and now you, madam, I believe you're married to a sailor. Do you like it? No, I don't. It's no fun being married to one. Do you know my husband hasn't been home for six years? Yes, but surely that's to be expected with a sailor. Yes, but he's on the Woolwich Ferry. <laughs> Finally, let's have a word with someone who has just returned from an ocean cruise. Now, sir, would you tell us something about your experiences at sea? Oh, no, no. Oh, oh no. Don't ask me that. Oh, I don't want to bring that up again. You didn't really enjoy it, then? Oh, no, I didn't. I stay in my cabin the whole trip. I see. Then you, you wouldn't agree that ocean cruises are good for you? No, I wouldn't. If you ask me, they're all bunk. <laughs> well, it's only to be expected that in a seafaring nation such as ours, men have always found pride and pleasure in building beautiful ships. And to a shipbuilder, there's nothing more thrilling than that moment when his vessel is ready for her maiden voyage. Hello, Rodney. Hello, Charles. <laughs> what a wonderful day this must be for you. Well, Rodders, there she is. Isn't she a beauty? My word, yes. What exquisite lines, and how majestic she looks afloat. Yeah, I must say she's absolutely ship shape. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh, you are a wag. <laughs> what are you going to call her? I've been keeping it a, a big surprise. I shall call her the... S.S. Rodney Tania. Oh! Oh, Charles, I'm honoured. It's not every day I have a boat named after me. Well, Rodney, I only hope she lives up to her specifications, but this trial run will soon show any weaknesses in the construction. Yeah, it must be a frightening moment for you. I mean, what on earth would you do if it should break down? Simple. I should just wade into the pond and bring her <laughs> Yes, we're proud of our British boats, and all the time new records are being sought after, such men as Donald Campbell, who is constantly striving to improve his incredible water speed record. To report on his latest attempt, we sent Cecil Snaith to Lake Coniston. Well, listeners, I'm standing now on the jetty to which the famous Bluebeard is moored. I expect you heard the sound of that high-powered engine, which was Donald Campbell arriving on his motorbike. <laughs> he is, however, in the boat now and making last-minute preparations for this thrilling run on Lake Coniston. Weather here is perfect, and I must say it's a grand day to take a boat out. I see the final instructions are now being given to the mechanics, and any moment now, Donald Campbell will be roaring off at high speed. Naturally, we all wish him the very best of luck. I think I shall get a better view of the takeoff if I move to the end of this jetty from where... Oh, bother. Excuse me, listeners, I see you've got my feet rather entangled in a coil of rope here. It's a, it's very careless of me. Just unravel myself. Oh! This is Cecil Snaefer, 
the second fastest man on water. <laughs> Returning you to the police studio. <laughs> Thank you, Cecil Bluebeard Snape. <laughs> yes, there's no doubt that Britain is indeed a seafaring nation, proud of its great naval heritage. Let's now pay tribute to those legendary names that have made naval history. Could they but speak now? Hood. My life was the sea. Rally. Got a fag on your mate. <laughs> Hawkins. I hope you like my last picture. <laughs> Nelson. It's not my pigeon. <laughs> Rodney. Hello, Charles. <laughs> and, of course, Drake. Hello, my darling. <laughs> Yes, we are indeed proud. <laughs> oh, yes, I'm sorry, I forgot. Hornblower. <laughs> Finally, let us consider the shipwrecked mariner. One of the most popular yarns of life at sea that the sailor tells is of being shipwrecked on a desert island with a beautiful girl. But does it always happen like this? <laughs> Oh, 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 thank goodness, safe at last. Oh, what a hard swim that was. Still here I am at last on this beautiful desert island. Oh, the first thing I must do is find myself a pretty little native girl. Ambrose. Oh, lummy. <laughs> Me dream shattered. How did you get here, you old faggot? I clung on to your precious Ambrose. No wonder I had such a hard swim. Ambrose, what? isn't it romantic, <laughs> darling? <laughs> you and I being washed up together on a desert island. Oh, we were washed up years ago. <laughs> oh, Ambrose, it was very clever of you to find your way to this place. Yes. How did you do it? I just followed the seabirds. Oh, Without them, I couldn't have done it. No. Uh, thank heavens for little girls. <laughs> for little oh, girls. No, oh, Ambrose, Ambrose, dear. Yes. We must face facts. What are we going to do now that we're shipwrecked on a desert island? Don't say you forgot to bring the gramophone. <laughs> Ambrose, I'm afraid I did. It was all I, all I could do to manage the gramophone. Yeah, look, uh, uh, a footprint in the sand. Oh, perhaps it's Friday. Don't be, don't be daft, it's Monday. <laughs> yeah, and that footprint tells us one thing: this island is inhabited. Oh, Oh, oh. Oh, you stay here and light a fire, and I'll go and have a scout round. Don't leave me alone, Ambrose. Ambrose, come back to you. All right, darling. I found a board with some writing on it. What does it say? Welcome to the Isle of Wight. <laughs> Well, there you are. There'll be another horn rama next week when the subject will be road signs. Do they create a diversion? <laughs> also, next week's programme, we'll be having a talk on what's on, given by Sherlock Holmes. What's on? <laughs> There'll be a new quiz game for road menders called Take Your Pick. <laughs> and there'll be an excerpt from the new play which deals with an ill-matched line of chorus girls entitled The Long and the Short and the Tall. <laughs> So until next week then, this is Kenneth Horn saying goodbye for now and leaving you with another thought from a listener. Do postmen carry out orders to the last letter? Good night. <laughs>
You might have been listening to or have just missed Beyond Our Ken, a sort of recorded radio show which gave employment to Kenneth Horne and also to Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Betty Marsden, Bill Pertwee, Patricia Lancaster, the Fraser Hayes Four and the BBC Review Orchestra conducted by Harry Rabinowitz. The script, believe it or not, was written and letters of complaint should be sent to Eric Merriman and Barry Took. However, the owners must inevitably fall on our producer, Jake Brown. <laughs>